We're going to open our meeting with uh, a quiet time and follow it with the set-aside prayer. God, please help me set aside everything I think I know about myself, the 12 steps, the big book, the meetings, my disease, and you, God, so I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please let me see the truth. Amen. Thank you. The big book... Uh, the book Alcoholics Anonymous that's nicknamed the big book was first published in April 1939. Now back then we were a society of readers. Radios were still new and if you wanted to see a movie you had to go to your local theater. Now of course we have many kinds of home and portable entertainment available. Consequently many of us don't read as much as, as we used to so we can't expect everyone who comes to AA to read our book without some prompting, like maybe poke them with a sharp stick. But today, we're going to read a lot from our basic text. Reading the big book is the only way to learn from it. We hope that today's experience will encourage you to visit these pages often. You might want to think of the big book as your best friend. We're going to start by reading the foreword to the first edition at the top of Roman numeral page 13, X-I-I-I. It's the first paragraph. Forward to the first edition. Yeah. It's forward to the first edition, first page. It says, We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope that these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. So the big book authors immediately tell us that the main purpose of this book is to show others precisely how we have recovered from alcoholism. Precisely means no variation or deviation. No room for opinion here. Now this is a revolutionary statement because before the big book was written there was no hope for alcoholics. Now anyone who is willing to follow the directions they have provided can recover. Now we're going to read the original preamble as it appeared back then, and this starts with the last line of the same page. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. Okay, let's begin our spiritual journey. During the fourth step, we identified our shortcomings using the assets and liabilities checklist. Now in the sixth step, we make the preparations necessary to turn these shortcomings over to our higher power. We are instructed to review the first five steps to make sure we haven't omitted anything. And if you have done this, you're ready to proceed to the sixth step. Step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. In this step, we have to answer a simple question. And that starts on the top of the next page, 76. page 76. If we, have, if we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. It is decision time once again. We realize they want you to take your sixth step on the same day that you shared your fourth step with your sponsor or sharing partner. Now we're going to start with a moment of silence. We're going to have a moment of silence. And you can ask the God of your understanding for the willingness to let go of the liabilities that you found were blocking you when you shared your inventory. 
Now these are the items on the left side of your checklist that have the most check marks to the right of them, or the circles around them. If you still are holding on to some of these shortcomings, you pray for the willingness to let go of them. So please have your checklist in front of you. Now we'll observe a minute of silence. Let's now pray for the willingness to let go of our shortcomings. Thank you. Please stand. And we're going to ask uh, one at a time, yes or no. And after you've answered our, uh, our question, we will sit down. And here is our six-step question. Are you now ready to let God remove from you all the things that you have admitted are objectionable? Absolutely. <coughs> Wonderful. We've, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I missed you back here. Okay, they're good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I didn't mean to leave you out. Wonderful. We have now completed the sixth step. We're ready to move on to the seventh step. We're going to move right along now. Step seven. Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. This step is straightforward. It consists of a prayer in which we ask our higher power to remove our liabilities and strengthen our assets so we can be of maximum service to all. You'll see that throughout the book. The whole point of this is get right with ourselves so we can make ourselves helpful, helpful to others. Now we're going to uh, have Brian read the seventh step prayer, which you have a copy of. And then we're going to again gather in a circle and we're going to hold hands and do this together. Okay, it's on the second paragraph, page 76. It says, When ready, we say something like this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. We have then completed step seven. Okay, those who are ready, let's form a circle, hold hands, and read the prayer.
Okay, now it's time to clear away the wreckage of our past. Now we do this by making amends or restitution. Step eight. Made a list of all persons we'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. In the next line down on page 76, we find the directions. Now we need more action without which we find faith without works is dead. Let's look at steps 8 and 9. We have a list of all persons we had harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Remember, it was agreed in the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. So hold on to your fourth step inventory. It contains your eight step amends list. Your amends are the names at the top of the page that have one or more check marks under them. Now making a list is only the first half of step eight. Now we need to pray for the willingness to make amends to them all. Again, we're going to have another moment of silence as we look at the top of your of our inventory sheets and ask God for the willingness to make amends to them all. One minute, please, of silence. Thank you. We'd like to congratulate those who came up with a list of individuals and organizations and have the willingness to make amends to them all. According to the big book authors, you have taken step eight. Congratulations. Step 9. May direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. We may be hesitant to make amends to those who are still upset with us or suspicious of our motives. As we continue down in the next paragraph on page 76, we're given some guidelines. Probably there are still some misgivings. As we look over the list of business acquaintances and friends we have hurt, we may feel diffident about going to some of them on a spiritual basis. Let us be reassured. To some people, we need not and probably should not emphasize a spiritual feature on our first approach. We might prejudice them. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order. But this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. It is seldom wise to approach an individual who still smarts from our injustice to him and announce that we have gone religious. In the prize ring, this would be called leading with the chin. Why lay ourselves open to being branded fanatics or religious bores? We may kill a future opportunity to carry a beneficial message, but our man is sure to be impressed with a sincere desire to set right the wrong. He's going to be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than in a talk of spiritual discoveries. In the third line down on page 77, we are informed that we are here to serve God and our fellows. One of the most difficult amends to make now is to someone we genuinely don't like. But whether we like the person or not, we still must proceed. They even provide us with instructions on what to say. Starting with the ninth line in the next paragraph we read, Nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. It is harder to go to an enemy than to a friend but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, 
confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. Under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. Simply we tell them that we will never get over our drinking until we have done the utmost to straighten out our past. We are there to sweep off our side of the street, realizing that nothing worthwhile can be accomplished until we do so, never trying to tell him what he should do. His faults are not discussed. We stick to our own. If our manner is calm, frank, and open, we will be gratified with the result. It's made clear what we are to do about our debts, which is to pay them. It's a novel idea, huh? That didn't get a laugh, huh? You all got to wake up. All right. Now, we may not like the sacrifice required to make good on our bills, but sacrifice we must. The process forces us to rely on God for strength and courage to make good on our past misdeeds. Under God's direction, we find it much easier to make restitution than we ever thought possible. Now we're going to go to the second paragraph on page 78. It says, Most alcoholics owe money. I wonder how they figured that out. <laughs> we do not dodge our creditors. Telling them what we are trying to do, we make no bones about our drinking. They usually know it anyway, whether we think so or not. Nor are afraid of disclosing our alcoholism on a theory it may cause financial harm. Approaching this way, the most ruthless creditor will sometimes surprise us. In arranging the best deal we can, we let, them know, we let these people know we are sorry. Our drinking has made us slow to pay. We must lose our fear of creditors no matter how far we have to go, for we are liable to drink if we are afraid to face them. Keep in mind that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is facing the fear and walking through it. Now, to offer encouragement to those here who have not yet made any amends, we'd like to see a show of hands of those present who have made some amends. Let's see. That's a lot of you. Good. Now, how many of you were at first afraid to confront some of the people who are on your amends list? Interesting. Okay, now again with another show of hands. How many of you found that once you faced your fears, not only did you walk through the process, but you had a rewarding experience as a result of making your restitution? Pretty exciting, don't you think? Yeah, I think that's very encouraging. Almost all the same hands went up every time. Okay, now in the first paragraph on page 79, we're instructed to let our higher power be our guide. This reliance upon God is essential if we are to outgrow our fears. Although these reparations take a number of forms, there are some general principles which we find guiding, reminding ourselves that we've decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. We ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. We may lose our position or reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not sh shrink at anything. It is suggested we ask others for help before we make some of our own, uh, make some of our more difficult amends. We need direction, preferably from someone who understands the inventory and restitution process. Starting in the first paragraph on page 80, we are cautioned not to create further harm as we clean up our side of the street. Before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we should hear their consent. If we obtain permission, have consulted with others, asked God to help, and the drastic step is indicated, we must not shrink. In the first paragraph on page 82, we are again advised to seek our higher powers guidance as we make good on our past misdeeds. It's the first paragraph 82. Perhaps there are some cases where the utmost frankness is demand, demanded. No outsider can praise such an intimate situation. It may be that both will decide that the way of good sense and loving kindness is to let bygones be bygones. Each might pray about it having the upper one's happiness uppermost in mind. Remember, always we're trying to help our relationships, not harm our relationships. Always think of the other person. Now, this is an example of how we must be tactful and considerate of others as we make our amends. No one said it would be easy. It just has to be done. Now, on page 82, starting with the second line in the second paragraph, 82, second line in the second paragraph, the big book authors emphatically state that stopping drinking is only the beginning. 
We must take additional actions if we are to recover from alcoholism. And she said the second line in the second paragraph. It starts off, it says, Sometimes we hear an alcoholic say, the only thing he needs to do is to keep sober. Certainly he must keep sober, for there will be no home if he doesn't. But he is yet a long way from making good to the wife or parents whom for years he'd so shockingly treated. Now go down to the next paragraph. The alcoholic is like a tornado, roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead, affections have been uprooted, selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says sobriety is enough. Not drinking is not enough. They make that quite clear. Starting with the first paragraph on page 83, we are asked to let our actions rather than our words demonstrate to the people we have hurt by our conduct that we have changed. What our actions? What? Yep, yep, sorry, your actions are what's going to have to... I'm sorry? No, you can't just say you're sorry. Yeah. It says, yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful mumbling that we are sorry won't fit the bill at all. We ought to sit down with the family and frankly analyze the past as we now see it, being very careful not to criticize them. Their defects may be glaring, but the chances are that our own actions are partly responsible. So we clean house with the family, asking each morning in meditation that our Creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. We have to live it. Okay. We're told, here we're told in order to recover from alcoholism, we have to live the AA program. So we don't just take the steps, we live the steps on a daily basis. In the third paragraph on page 83, we're given directions on what to do if we can't make amends directly, in other words, to someone face to face. There may be some wrongs we can never fully right. We don't worry about them if we can honestly say to ourselves we would write them if we could. Some people cannot be seen. We send them an honest letter. I want to just uh, give you a couple examples here. I know somebody um, that I did a fifth step once with who said they had a problem with homeless people, that they had prejudice against homeless people. And uh, so what we came up with for the amends is that she go work in a soup kitchen for a while. See, we can get creative on how to make our amends and how to have a change of heart and attitude, you know. Um, I'm trying to think. There was another one that I wanted to mention. But, uh, you know, sometimes people pass away, you know, and we can just, uh, we can write a letter for ourselves and then, you know, to that person and then put that aside. But there's all kinds of ways of being creative, you know. There are ways to do this always. Um, well, if it comes to me, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right, now, um, starting with the fourth paragraph, we're told precisely what's going to happen once we commence to clear away the wreckage of our past. And they describe these benefits as promises. And as you've learned today, the big book is filled with promises, and these are just a few of them. Gus is going to read those. Gus. And Gus, would you like to come up here and read the uh, ninth step promises for us? My name is Gus. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. <laughs> and these are the ninth step promises taken from page 83 in the big book. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things, and we will gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and, e and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? 
They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Sorry for this. Thank you, Gus. Good job. What a message of hope. It's almost beyond comprehension that all of these wonderful events will come to pass if we just make amends to those whom we have harmed. But they will happen. That's a guarantee. Um, I think I just thought of what it was. Okay, I remember the story, what it was, another fifth step. Somebody had, um, had taken a lot of money from a business that no longer existed. They didn't know how to find the people to return the money. So we came up with the idea of finding a charity of their choice and estimating how much money it was and making a donation. You know, so there's all kinds of ways that we can do this. Now you are now you can now begin the amends process. Congratulations. <laughs> Step 10, continued to take personal inventory and when we are wrong, promptly admit it. The 10th step is a summary of steps 4 through 9. Step 10, uh, in, in steps 1, 2, and 3, we made a decision that put us on a spiritual path. Then in steps 4 through 9, we took the actions necessary to remove those things that have kept us separated from our higher power. Now we're ready to grow into the promised spiritual awakening. The key to the tenth step is the word continued. Starting in the second paragraph, now back in the book on page 84, we read... This thought brings us to step ten, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory, continue to set right any new mistakes as we go, go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we clean up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. For years I thought, oh, I did the steps. I'm good. Well, I suffered and so did everyone else around me for that. But here it tells us quite clearly this is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Now we continue to take inventory, continue to make amends, and continue to help others every day. Let's look at the third sentence in this paragraph again. It's very important. It reads, we have entered the world of the spirit. This sentence contains an amazing revelation. Basically, the big book authors have just informed us that our lives have already changed as a direct result of taking steps one through nine. They state that we have already had a spiritual awakening. How could that be? Well, it's very simple. There's no way we can take these steps alone and without a higher power. You have not only developed a belief in a, in a God of your understanding, but you've come to rely upon this power to help you through the inventory and sharing process. You're now living in the solution. The psychic change has already occurred. In the next line down, we are told how to maintain this psychic change by routinely taking a 10th step inventory. Continue. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Geez, I wonder where we heard of these before. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Brian likes to find out whether his sponsees are reading the book and says, What's our code? Uh, uh. <laughs> well, there it is. Love and tolerance is our code. Now, in this paragraph, we're presented with the AA test for self-will a third time. We described how to use this test in, steps th in step three to help us see the difference between self-will and God's will. Now here they instruct us to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. We are given specific directions on how to rid ourselves of these self-centered behaviors. We must take the actions necessary to move from living in self-will uh, to living in God's will. We discuss our shortcomings with our sponsor or sharing partner 
We ask our higher power to remove them and, if necessary, set right the wrong or make our amends. We then try to help someone else. Always think of others. It always says, do such and such, and then think of others, and then work with others. Always put our focus on making ourselves useful to others. We have to get outside of our selfishness. It's one of these divine principles that's in AA, the best way to get outside of ourselves and our selfishness. Make sure we're making ourselves of use to others. Now, we want to try to avoid living in self-will. We don't have to be driven by our destructive shortcomings that stem from resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. When we allow ourselves to go to this base state of mind and behavior, we suffer needlessly. Our aim is to live in honesty, unselfishness, purity, and love. These are the spiritual principles to live by. They are basic truths that are found in all sound religions, philosophies, and spiritual ideals. We find a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction when we're living on a higher plane of consciousness with higher standards to live up to. Living in God's will is also called right actions and right living. Keep in mind that this is a learning process. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Now, if we apply the AA test for self-will on a daily basis, God will remove our obsession to drink. This is another of the many promises we find throughout the text of the book. In the third paragraph on page 84, we read about the 10-step promises. Mick, will you please come up here and read our promises for a 10th step? Just leave it. The 10th step promises on uh, page 84. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. <clears throat> for by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude towards liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor we are afraid. That is our experience. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. Good job. Thank you, Mick. Now, how do we keep in fit spiritual condition? By taking a daily inventory. What is our reward? A daily reprieve. This daily reprieve is described in the next paragraph. It is easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How can I best serve thee, thy will not mine be done? These are thoughts which must, must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. This paragraph we just read confirms that we need to keep checking our thinking using the four standards. We ask ourselves constantly, are our thoughts selfish, are they selfish or in line with God's will? The decision to do God's will over self-will was made when we took step three. Now another reward we receive is God consciousness, direct contact with the spirit of the universe. In the next line down, we're given some more promises. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we have become God-conscious. 
We have begin, begun to develop this vital sixth sense, but we must go further, and that means more action. Once again, they insist that our lives have already changed. We are now conscious of the presence of God. If we continue to take the steps, this power greater than ourselves will guide our thoughts, our actions, and strengthen our intuition, which is our vital sixth sense. Our five senses are touch, hearing, smell, sight, and taste. Our sixth sense is the awareness of our higher power within, our God consciousness, our intuition. The direction for taking the tenth step is in the second paragraph on page 84, starting with the second line. Right in the middle of the line, it says, We continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. Now, will those who are ready to take the tenth step please stand? Here is our tenth step question. Will you continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as you go along? Yes, I will. Congratulations. Done it again.